percent of the backlog that there is in the NHS now, so it's very difficult to clear the backlog. The other side of that is, um, in emergency departments, you've got growing numbers of people waiting extraordinary lengths of time in an emergency department. It was, you know, virtually unheard of to have people wait, waiting 12 hours or 24 hours in an emergency department before the pandemic. But now, but now those numbers are growing to quite alarming levels, and we've had warnings from emergency medicine doctors about the consequences of that as well. That those kind of that data gives you a picture of just how stretched the NHS. Is and that's because demand is going up more than the capacity, and that was happening before COVID, but it's actually been exacerbated significantly because of it. And if you've got people waiting on a waiting list for something like a hip operation, or maybe it's a skin complaint, or a ear, nose, throat problem, or something, and they can't get that help, it steadily gets worse, and that requirement for help gets. Um, ever more urgent and that just adds to the pressure Um, and it's really down to capacity but also the fact that there are not enough staff to deal with the ever increasing demand and I think that's why you've seen these organisations probably for quite a long time now saying that we need to be having a really frank, honest open discussion involving the public about what the NHS actually can afford to deliver Um, but it's becoming ever more pressing now as we see the, the, the kind of pressures just grow and grow and grow in the system and people not getting the help that they need so it's 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 two things that we say it's the aging population and more complex health needs and the backlog from covid that we still haven't worked our way through it's those two combining in a perfect storm in a sense yes but also the fact that for a long time now there have been real, real challenges and um, with staffing in the nhs i mean that we, we wouldn't need enough, as many staff if we didn't have such um, such a, a huge demand on the system, obviously. But the fact is that, um, you know, because uh, people require more and more medical attention, then we need more staff to be able to do that. And although there are record numbers of people working for the NHS, they're still not keeping up with, with the demand on it. Um, you know, I think the other thing to think about as well is, um, you, you know, like there, there, we, we talk a lot about what's going on in hospitals and the pressures on hospitals, but Andrew Pugh, whom you were talking to as a GP, and there's a huge amount of pressure on primary care, there's a huge amount of pressure on social care as well, and so the whole system is sort of grinding to, to a halt. Um, and the other thing about it is, of course, you've got to remember about the NHS is actually incredible because of innovation and technology, and if you think back to 1948 when the NHS was founded, you know, we, we couldn't do nearly as many things as we can do now. So if medicine continues to advance, which means that we can do more and more and more things, but that is also expensive and decisions need to be made about what sort of, like, you know, what medical advances we can afford to provide as well. So there's, there's lots of different things in it, but as, as you see, ageing population, more complex needs um, is really the thing that's driving driving the kind of d- demand for the service at the moment. Well, that's an interesting point, Lisa, because lots of people are saying AI is, is going to be one of the things that will be a, a huge boon, actually, for the NHS and, and really help in, in the years ahead. I've got a statement from the Scottish Government in front of me this morning. You'll know this well. We know our approach to planning and delivering needs to change to enable recovery. Policy and prospectus programme for government is clear. Reform is needed. But the fundamentals of Scotland's NHS will not change. We remain committed to free access, to help to the improvement of health outcomes and to the reduction of health inequalities that persist in our communities. That's what Scottish Government say on this. So they're ruling out any fun- fundamental change about the way the service is delivered, but they hammer on this point that ref- reform is required. What do they mean by reform? Uh, interestingly enough, I, I did actually speak to Michael Matheson, the Health Secretary, about this just uh, yesterday, and he said that very thing, that they are very much committed to that founding principle of the NHS, that it should be uh, free at the point of delivery. But he did acknowledge that reform was absolutely fundamentally necessary. He said that he would be setting out some plans for that in the new year, and a lot of that would be focusing about investing in that kind of community healthcare aspect, because actually... 90% of healthcare is delivered in the community, something like 90%. Don't quote me on it, but it's a huge, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge figure. Um, and so focusing a lot of resources on that and on social care through the National Care Service that they want to um, to deliver. Um, 
it would be about the kind of long-term planning and maybe trying to help people avoid needing hospital care, uh, maybe taking the pressure off hospitals so that it dealt with more urgent care. That's the sort of thing that he said he's talking about. He, he, was, he didn't give me much details on that, but he said that the government were working on that kind of long-term strategic um, plan to make sure that the NHS was sustainable in the future, but that they were not considering at all a system where people would have to pay. But then on the other hand, what you have to look at is do you... You know, while we don't necessarily have um, a huge amount of data on what's going on in the private sector, you can actually see some data that shows more and more people are, are choosing to self-fund private care because they can't wait. You hear lots of stories about people going abroad um, for medical care. Maybe it used to be cosmetics, but now you hear about people going over for more complex procedures like hip or knee replacements. Um, and also, um, earlier this week, we were talking to um, a clinic, a private clinic in Glasgow, um, who said that actually they started off mostly doing cosmetic things like lip fillers or Botox, that sort of thing. But now they're inundated with people saying to them that they can't get seen on the NHS for things like cysts that are very visible and, and prominent or, or other kind of like uh, conditions that the NHS may not be able to prioritise that mean a huge amount to the individual and are stopping them living their normal life. So they have chosen to, to maybe save their, spend their savings getting those kind of treatments too. Lisa, thanks so much for your time and your expertise on this this morning. Lisa Summers, BBC Scotland's health correspondent there. What's your view on all this? What needs to change to save the NHS? 80295 to text us this morning or 08085 92 and 95 double. What's been your experience of this? Are you currently on an NHS waiting list? 828,398 people. Are you one of them? This morning in Scotland, if you work on the NHS and you've been listening to this conversation, you know better than anyone what the system is and how the system works. What do you think needs to change from the inside? Would you be prepared to pay for some services within healthcare in Scotland? Or is the NHS, the founding principles of it way back to 1948, are they sacrosanct as far as you are concerned? 08085 92 to give us a call or 80295 if you want to text us on this this morning. Let's speak to Alistair next this morning. Alistair, morning. Good morning. Talk me through what your experience has been here. Well, my experience with the NHS is very good. They've been very good to me, but I recently had uh, something happen that uh, surprised me quite a bit. Uh, I'm diabetic and I went for a routine inspection of my feet to the doctor. She noticed I had a, an ingrown toenail and it was inflamed. She said to me, you better speak to a podiatrist about that and uh, get it uh, seen to. So I did that and uh, I was told I would need to have a telephone conversation with somebody about this and I did. This person was a person who had previously sorted my toenails uh, and uh, he said that the doctors didn't, they don't know everything about uh, those uh, people's toenails and uh, uh, we'll, need to, we'll need to get you in somewhere which he had difficulty doing but I just thought when the doctor recommended that it should be seen surely I didn't need to speak to someone on the telephone about it mm. And, and, and did you have to pay for any of that at all, or was that all done no, within I, the NHS? I, I, I was paying previously to get my toenails and that sorted, but I found that it was, uh, uh, most of these people that I went to didn't have the same uh, sort of level of skills as what the people with the NHS uh, have. We, if, if they did, Alistair, would you be prepared to pay for that, if, if you yes. can? Yes, I, I mean, I have paid. I have paid. I've gone private in the past when I had to. Yeah. And that was because of waiting lists and because you wanted yeah. something just dealt with straight away? Yeah, more or less. I, Is that yeah. the direction you think we're heading in? Well, um, I, I'm not sure if uh, we, uh, that it should be that uh, we have to pay for it. We paid, I mean, I've paid my taxes now all my life, and, and now I probably need a bit more gear. And uh, I would have said that uh, because I've worked all my life still working at 76, that uh, I don't see why I should 
have to pay and somebody who never works gets eleven free. Because you paid your national insurance all, all these years. Alistair, th thanks for your time this morning and your experience of that. Uh, more stories this morning, your stories of uh, experiences within the NHS. And um, if you're on a waiting list, if you were dealt with promptly around all this as well, have you had to look at some private support because of a medical condition you've had and difficulty getting seen around this? If you work in the health sector, if you are a hospital consultant, if you're a hospital administrator, I'd love to hear from you on all this this morning. 80295 to text us or 08085 92 Let's go to Fort William. Uh, James is there this morning. Uh, he's a GP, I think. James, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. We're trying to have a national conversation, sensible conversation this morning about the future for healthcare. What do you think needs to change as a GP with, gosh, nearly 50 years' experience? That's right, yes. Um, I've been working for the NHS for 48 years now, since 1975, and I'm, interestingly enough, I'm still working age 72, which is a bit unusual, uh, but still enjoying um, seeing patients and enjoying my work. So not everybody is just retiring and giving up. Um, in terms of the things that you've mentioned this morning, there are a couple of uh, very quick points to, to, to address right at the beginning of, of, the, of, of the conversation. Um, we, we need good managers and we good, need, good, need good information technology. So I think it's often said, well, let's cycle the managers. Unfortunately, that's not going to work and, and would actually make things uh, less efficient. Um, we need to spend uh, much more money and, and balance um, in favour of social care. So instead of um, employing lots of super specialists, um, we should probably be, be super specialist doctors, that is. Um, I think we should be spending more money on social care and um, we have um, huge numbers of people stuck in hospitals, unable to get out because care packages can't be set up. And that's because care, people who provide care really get a very uh, relatively uh, poor, poor rate of care. So we've got to somehow or other rebalance that in favour of what we spend the money on. And I think we've got to actively uh, increase the spending um, on care workers out in the community doing the most basic job uh, to keep people um, out of hospitals um, and also in nursing homes. Um, the nursing home sector is, is absolutely fundamental to, to, this, to the NHS and that's under huge pressure at the moment because of uh, various sort of cutbacks and funding things. And I think we certainly need to, if we've got a choice of spending, we need to uh, spend, spend a, a much bigger proportion of the NHS budget on care workers, caring for people in the community and also on nursing homes. The other thing is, various people have said uh, we keep having reports and having this conversation and discussing it and then never actually doing anything about it. Um, somebody mentioned the Kerr report earlier on, and the Kerr report certainly needs to be looked back again. Uh, that was 20 years ago. There was a very good uh, 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 document which was produced by the Scottish Government and uh, the NHS in general uh, about seven years or even ten years ago now um, called Realistic Medicine which everybody signed up to and thought was a great idea, but unfortunately we have great difficulty actually implementing it, uh, mainly because um, of difficulties with, with people worried about being sued. Um, and that needs to be part of the adult conversation that we have. Um, you mentioned different models of healthcare in other parts of the world. The one that um, I think is probably uh, one that's worth considering um, is the Swedish model. Um, the Swedish model has an interesting system where um, each person in, in the country has a budget uh, at the start of the year of 100, of, in their system it's kroner, so it would be 100 kroner, about 100 pounds. And um, every time that they um, see a GP, they have to pay 5 kroner or 5 pounds. Every time they get a prescription, they have to pay um, uh, 2.5 kroner. And if they have something like a chest x-ray or an x-ray, then it's 10 kroner. And if they get referred to a specialist, then it's 15 kroner. And once, they've, once their £100 budget has been um, spent uh, throughout the year, then the rest of the year is then free. So if they've spent it all by April, they've required that amount of resource by April, uh, then it all clicks onto being free from then on, and then it resets itself again at the beginning of the following, following year. The various opt-outs in the system, so what happens is that people on very low income and children don't have to, they, they get, they don't have to pay, the, they don't have the, the £100 uh, kitty at the start of the year. But I think it's probably one of the, one of the ways of, um, if you like, fair rationing of, of health care. It recognises the fact that children and people who, who've got absolutely no ability to pay um, don't pay anything. But it does recognise the idea that, well, it, it, it's the same 
um, you know, it's, it's the old cup of, cup, of, cup of coffee argument that you may uh, go into uh, a coffee shop and spend five pounds on having a cup of coffee, and, and yet you go and see your GP and uh, pay nothing. So that would be, if we do have to ration health care, and we do have to have some sort of barriers, I think the Swedish system is certainly worth considering. James, Although, that, that, can I just ask a quick, quick question of you? Um, you sound like a fabulous GP, by the way, but in an, in an average week, uh-huh. what percentage of appointments in your surgery are missed? Um, yeah, quite a few, but um, we do have systems where we send people texts and so on about appointments and so on. Um, yes, no, give, me, give me a figure, 10%, 15%, um, yes, twice more? About, I would say about 10%. Um, but the difficulty with the missed appointments things, there was a very good paper which was produced in Scotland, actually, it won the research paper of the year last year, um, which said uh, very clearly that the people who keep defaulting from patient, from, from uh, appointments are actually the people in, in, in most need. So they're people with chaotic lifestyles. Um, and um, so, in fact, it would be very wrong to start penalising that group because that group who do uh, default from, from appointments and so on are often the people with greatest need. And if I, in my own personal uh, surgeries and so on, if somebody uh, defaults and doesn't, doesn't turn up, I certainly take a note of it and, and look, about it, look at it and think about why that's happened and maybe send them a text or put a, put a, a message on, the, on their phone um, if, to see if there's a problem. Um, and I breathe a, a little sigh of relief that I've now got another 15 minutes uh, for the next patient because time is very pressured and, and we have to work very efficiently. So I'd be not, certainly not keen on going down the path of heavily penalising or fining people who keep defaulting because those are the people, usually in deprived communities, um, who often have the greatest health needs. And in fact, when they eventually do come, they're the ones that have delayed coming because uh, and maybe they've got a cancer diagnosis or something like that. So um, I, I would be very reluctant to go down the path of, of, of financial penalty. I hear you. But James, just, just, just final question. Um, you, you've been at this. Uh, sorry, did you say you were 72? Yes. Yeah, you've been, you've been at this 48 years in the NHS. Are you, are you worried about the NHS? I mean, we have the president of the Royal College of Physicians saying he says uh, unless something changes, it won't reach its centenary. Is he right? Yes. Yes, I am very worried. I mean, right the way, I was born in the NHS, and uh, right the way throughout my life, I've been utterly committed to the NHS. It, it, I went into the NHS as a vocation and, and a sense of out, of out of a sense of duty and wanting to care for people, and I still have that sense of, of duty. And um, I think when you're talking about how to retain staff and so on, I, I'm I'm still very happy doing the job that I do, working with a fantastic team in a wonderful community. So I find it easy to continue working because I still enjoy my job. But also, um, I have children who work in the in the uh, NHS um, in Glasgow, and um, when I hear them talking about some of the the, the petty things that go on um, about sort of ca- no car parking at the hospitals, um, difficulty parking. Uh, not providing um, access to, to meals for junior junior staff and so on, um, all sorts of, sort of silly little things that wouldn't cost a huge amount of money that would, that, that that annoy people um, and would improve retention. So uh, the crazy sort of stuff that went on in hospital planning and building the new Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, um, they built it without any initially without any proper parking, and that really messed up.
Ten, 9.50 on a Thursday morning. It's BBC Radio Scotland. When you first found out that I had cerebral palsy, what impact did that have on you? It was a shock at first. Dad and I are so proud of you for what you've achieved. As Michael McEwen marks his 40th birthday, he looks at how attitudes surrounding disability have changed over the past four decades. What was the main benefits of teaching disabled pupils in the local schools, do you think? It's about an identity in your own community, isn't it? People actually see the disability before they see the person. It's our job really to make sure that we get that opportunity to show what we're really about. Disability with Attitude, Sunday morning from 7.30 on BBC Radio Scotland and Sounds. Mornings with Stephen Jordan still to come with me this St Andrews Day. Your imagination just runs wild. I mean, who could fail to get lost in a place like this? Well known uh, from Country File, of course, Julia Bradbury, presenter, has been on a mission to tackle homelessness for the last seven years. Uh, this morning she'll join us to talk about it in the run-up to Christmas and talking of the health service if you're on waiting lists at the moment or you've got a question for your GP and you're having difficulty being seen. Our resident doctor is here to deal with all your health questions. This morning you can get in touch. Text now 80295 or email stephen at bbc.co.uk. Catch up on the conversation. Listen via the BBC Sounds app. Mornings with Stephen Jardin on BBC Radio Scotland. The former head of the NHS in Scotland has called for a debate about private sector involvement as the number of patients on waiting lists hits another record high this autumn. Professor Paul Gray said the service is unsustainable in its current form. His views echoed by the president of the Royal College of Physicians, who's called for a national conversation with the public on NHS priorities and warned that otherwise the service won't reach its centenary. Scotland's health secretary Michael Matheson says reform is needed, but the NHS must remain free at the point of delivery. So this morning, ahead of the general election campaign next year, where the NHS will be central to that, we're going to have this national conversation for another eight minutes. What needs to change to save the NHS? 80295 to text 0885 9295 to blow rod. People need to take responsibility, keep themselves healthy. The NHS and the government need to push this far more, stop the problems at the source. Shona and Dunblane government needs to prioritise investment into healthy living, help reduce pressure on the NHS. Richard and Argyle, if we get rid of the professional managers, then the highly skilled doctors and nurses will have to do all the admin, etc. Do we really want that being done by brain surgeons or cardiologists? Phil, this morning, I struggle to understand to a full-time NHS doctor can be physically and mentally fit and totally focused on patient care if they're also working in the private sector. I work a 47 hour week and find it hard enough and need the respite from work to be able to remain focused and enthusiastic for that. Another one, the conversation needs to be about prevention and a genuine focus on how to create good health and well-being. And Lindsay and Falk, at morning Lindsay, going private for my mental health after many years of sparse NHS treatment was life-changing for me. I just wish I'd it before, but it wasn't cheap. 80295 to text 08085 9295 to blue to give us a call on this this morning. Let's speak to Elizabeth Roddick next this morning, who's a community pharmacist. Another perspective on this. Uh, Elizabeth, morning. Good morning. What do you see coming through to you, and what do you think needs to change with the NHS? I think we, yes, I think a lot of your callers then have talked about prevention and that's linked to deprivation, that's linked to education. So that's an absolutely huge topic that really needs to be talked about. The, obviously, as, as the pharmacy side of things, we've always said it should be free at the point of contact, but there's a huge amount of wastage. Do patients really value medicines? Uh, we have people coming in after, after a death of a, of a relative with, with bags full of medicine. So we are trying to deal with that from the pharmacy side, looking at things like medicine care and review, where we get a, a year's prescription from a doctor and, and we actually manage that, and that's reducing wastage. But I think, interestingly, I, I work in a very a reasonably affluent area and, and some of my patients want to pay it's interesting they, they want to pay for their paracetamol or as an independent prescriber I maybe examine them I maybe give them a prescription and, and I see them reaching for their wallet or, or their purse because they just assume that, that they would need to pay for that so it's an interesting 
uh, let's say, dilemma. Um, are there people out there who actually would pay? That, if, that's the question. If medicines are brought back to you, unopened, untouched, what happens to them? They're sent to the health board for incineration. I mean, it, it's actually, we, we're really, if you think about it, where have they been stored? Uh, are they still 100% in terms of, of the quality of the medicine? We cannot say that, and therefore we must send them away for incineration back to the health board. So at the moment, until there is someone looking at that site, yeah, we have to just throw them out, and it's a terrible waste, yeah. What do you think needs to change? I'm going to put you in charge for the next few minutes. What would you do? Well, certainly the whole prevention side, a link with deprivation, needs to be looked at. I think I've, I've said before that there needs to be the right professional dealing with whatever. There's a lot of wastage. And why are people going to A&E when they could be seeing their community pharmacist or their GP? Uh, so there's a lot of wastage in, in the, the NHS and... In a sense, that's tinkering with it, but please put more resources into primary care. We can do much, much more with with the correct resources, and maybe that will stop people having to go into hospital uh, where the cost is, is much greater. Uh, the sustainability of the NHS with new drugs, fantastic new drugs, new procedures, we really need to think about how, how do we sustain that in, in the future? And I think it's all about resourcing the right people in the right place. It's about educating the public, prevention, linked with deprivation, the whole social care side, trying to stop people becoming sick in the first place. Uh, it's a huge, huge topic. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you've given us some food for thought there. Elizabeth, thank you for your time this morning. Elizabeth Rodick is a community pharmacist. Uh, let's go to Glasgow this morning. Sarah Jean is there, a podiatrist. Sarah Jean, you work in... Morning. morning, morning. You work in the NHS and the private sector as well, I don't do, you? yes. I work in the NHS because I'm involved in research. I'm currently doing a PhD and I am passionate about the diversity of um, the patients in the NHS that you, you, you don't see in private practice. So I do both. So I see it across both spectrums. Um, I think my point I picked up uh, listening was from your health correspondent. Um, and I think something that's not been mentioned this morning or that I certainly not picked up on, I do agree that we have an aging population, that we have um, an NHS system that is not designed to be with osteoarthritis, it's not designed to be with these chronic conditions, fibromyalgia, etc. Um, but what we have been to mention this morning is Brexit. And I think that we do need to address and discuss that because that has impacted on things like staffing shortages due to the change in immigration policy, the uncertainties about different medical supplies, so we need to put um, a woman over there today, heading for menopause, and you know, I'm concerned about access to those sorts of drugs. Um, so I think that that's something that we haven't really got to the table today, and I do think that we do need to be addressing that. Um, in terms of, I totally agree with the GP we had on the about health inequalities. My uh, master's uh, was in public health, and uh, working within the diet practice in the east end of Glasgow, I see first-hand the health inequalities. Uh, it, is, it is real. Your, your average person, your normal people, whatever normal is, don't really see that and it's hard to understand but those most vulnerable and we're talking about it could be language barriers it could be people who are homeless social surfing, don't have a family food drug, alcoholism their lives are so chaotic that it, even giving them an appointment and saying you have to be somewhere at this time is impossible for them to meet the demands of that and I know that for us but that is a, a normal thing for me only. That isn't. That is a huge barrier. Not to mention the cost of getting to the appointment, possible childcare issues, possible problems maybe and, in a low And, and the fact is, the yeah. NHS is there for all, every single person, isn't it? Well, that was the idea back in 1948, at least. Sarah Jane, thank you very much indeed. Keep your views coming on this. We'll do more texts. 80295 after the news. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And on BBC Sounds. BBC Radio Scotland. Ten o'clock. The BBC Radio Scotland news comes from Martin Smith.